Yes, Mr. Sargent. My lords, my lady. At trial, the learned judge concluded first that the brakes were squatters in the cottage. Second, their only right to possession arose from their adverse possession. Third, the sole beneficial owner of the cottage was the trustee in bankruptcy, Mr. Swift. And fourth, Mr. Swift, as absolute beneficiary, was entitled to authorise Cheddington to take possession of the cottage and the brakes. We submit the judge's conclusions were right both on the facts and in his application of the law to those facts. The central point of law of this appeal is about the purpose and effect of license. License is an instrument of dispensation or authorization. That was settled in common law in the 17th century, a decision to which uh, my Lord Lord Justice Lewison referred uh, of Thomas and Sorrell, which is at tab four in authority one. No, this was a sorry. case about licenses in the context of the sale of alcohol. Mr. Sorrell sold wine in the parish of Stepney without a specific license from the Crown. Mr. Thomas sued on behalf of the Crown to recover a fine. Mr. Sorrell relied on his membership of the Vintners Company by way of defence. And the famous passage from Chief Justice Vaughan's judgment is the one that I referred uh, your lordship to uh, in the course of this morning, page 23 of uh, Authority 1. Uh, and could I ask you just to, to, to read that? It's a very brief passage. Page 23 of Authority 1. And could I ask you to read from the start of the paragraph, uh, beginning a dispensation to the break? Yeah. So a license makes lawful an action that would otherwise be unlawful. It follows that to understand the purpose and effect of a license, the first the court must first consider the relevant basis on which it would be unlawful in the absence of a license. This is a point made by the judge himself in another uh, trial judgment handed down at the same time as the judgment now under appeal. This is the so-called possession judgment. My Lord, uh, Lord Justice Arnold will recall refusing permission to appeal on that judgment at the hearing in April. Can I ask you uh, to go uh, put away authorities one and go to authorities three, tab 36, bundle page 762. This was, about, this was about the house rather than the cottage, is that right? Uh, uh, my Lord, exactly, but uh, I'm relying on it for what Ms. Lordship said uh, about licensing. A summary which I don't believe to be controversial. So, page 762, uh, can I ask you to read paragraph 222. Well, again, that's expressed exclusively in terms of trespass. Do you dispute the proposition that the unlawfulness may consist of something other than trespass? Yes. Uh, no, I don't. I don't. Well, in Thomas and Sorrel itself, as you said, it was selling wine without a license. Exactly. exactly. Uh, the, 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 the key sentence is the last sentence. We submit. Everything depends on exactly what permission is needed uh, and what permission is then granted under the license. In this appeal, there are two different licenses authorizing two different kinds of activity. First, there is the license relied upon by the appellant, the breaks, which is contained in the drawings provision of the agreement of the partnership that had been dissolved in 2013. As I will show you in these submissions, that was a license in the sense of providing authorization or an exemption from the fiduciary no profit. And my learned friend helpfully conceded that. Uh, 
transcript 63, lines 13 to 20. That is not the type of common law license intended to fall within the scope of the uh, Protection from Eviction Act, 1977. That is our principal answer to ground two of the appeal, although we have our other answers too, including on residence. Uh, and second, there is the license relied upon by the respondent of Sheddington. This is the license granted in 2019 by the trustee in bankruptcy, Mr. Swift. Sheddington's case is that this second license operated both in equity and at common law. Insofar as the breaks were concerned, in equity, this was an instruction by the beneficiary under the Bear Trust to permit Cheddington to take possession. That was not an instruction they could or should have refused as trustees of that Bear Trust. And at common law, as a matter of agency, it was the basis on which Mr. Swift asserted possession of the cost, acting by Cheddington as his licensee. Those are our answers to ground one of the appeal. Before turning to the detail of those grounds, there's a correction I need to make to our skeleton argument. So, so wait a minute. So you you have to say then that Mr. Swift had a better common law right to possession than the breaks. Yes. Because a lot of um, Mr. Le uh, Learmouth's um, submissions were directed to the contrary. Yes, right. I'll, I'll deal with that. Yeah. Uh, my, my, my lords, my lady, can, can I just correct what we said in our skeleton argument? Uh, paragraph 4, uh, I think it's behind tab 13, but if you've got the skeleton available, we said in paragraph 4 that ground 2 is logically prior to ground 1. On reflection, we accept that's wrong, and my learned friends are entirely right to put ground 1 foreground. And the, the reason for that becomes clear. If we look at the 1977 Act, uh, and uh, you will have it well in mind, uh, but if we can just go to that briefly, it's in the Supplemental Authorities Bible, and it's uh, page 5. see that section 3.1 is a prohibition against the, and I quote, the owner in relation to any premises for the benefit of tenants. The breaks, of course, claim to have a license rather than a lease. Section uh, 3.2b, which is lower down, extends the uh, section 3.1 prohibition to licenses. And on page 14, at section Eight, subsection three. We can see that the owner, my learned friend, it refers to, it, means the person who, as against the occupier, is entitled to possession thereof. So, if my learned friend is correct on ground one of the appeal, Cheddington was not entitled to possession of the cottage at the relevant date, so the prohibition in section three of the 1977 Act would not. Only if Cheddington succeeds on ground one of the appeal, and it can be regarded as an owner for the purposes of the 1977 Act, that the court will need to go on to consider ground two. And for that reason, we now accept ground one of the appeal logically comes, sorry, ground two logically comes after ground one. There's one other preliminary point, which is about the relevant date of assessment of the party's respective interest in the cottage. We say the relevant date is the 18th of January 2019. We address the what? 18th, 18th of, January. of January 2019. And we address it in our closing submission of trial, which uh, you will find, I believe, at Supplemental Bundle Tab 13. And it's, 
this in dispute? I mean, as I understood Mr. Learman's um, submissions to us, he was proceeding on the basis that the 18th of January was the, was the relevant date as well. I, 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 I'm not sure it's the answer, my lord. But, but for the I, purposes of ground one, of course, when we come to ground two, the question may be different. <coughs> Uh, I'll just give you the reference. In our closing submission for trial, it was paragraphs 108 to 112, which internal pages, line tab 13, are 47 to 49, because I think the court's, intern, uh, the court's um, uh, bundle uh, pages are slightly different to us. So it's tab 13 pages, internal 47 to 49. If I could now turn to ground one of the appeal. This challenges the reasoning of the judge at paragraphs 193 to 220 of the trial judgment. And that is uh, in the core bundle, tab 5, pages 101 to 107. Cheddington says that the judge's analysis was correct and should be upheld. We respectfully endorse the whole of this analysis, but in oral submissions, I would like to focus, if I may, on three key steps in the analysis. The first step is whether, as between the breaks and Mr. Swift, Mr. Swift was entitled to possession of the cottage. The second step is whether Mr. Swift was entitled in law to permit Sheddington to take possession for him. And the third step is whether the license in fact constituted such authority or delegation. And so I will address those three steps of the analysis in turn. I'm sorry, I'm missing the third one. The third, my lady, is, the third, is whether the license yep. in fact constituted such authority or delegation. I don't want to take you after your turn, but when you come to step three, could you show us the passage in the judgment that you rely upon as having reasoned in that way? Uh, my Lord. Uh, on the first step, the starting point is that the bear trust was not created by the bank. Rather, Mr. Swift was the successor in title and sole beneficiary under a bear trust of land which arose when the partnership acquired the cottage. We say the law. Say, sorry, say that again. Mr. Swift yeah. was the successor in title and sole beneficiary under a bear trust of land which arose when the partnership acquired the cottage. And we say the law is clear that once Mr. Swift acquired the partnership's beneficial interest under the trust, he was entitled to possession of the cottage. And if we can start with Lewin on Trust, which you'll find at tab 14 of the Supplemental Authority, You see from the top of the page that we're in the section of Lewin dealing with rights of beneficiaries of trust in the land. And there's a heading in the middle of the page, the right to occupy trust land. And the first sentence says this, in the case of a bare or simple trust of land, beneficiary has always been able to compel the trustee to put him into possession. And we see from footnote 258 
various cases referred to, including Attorney General against Lord Gore, uh, which my Lord, Lord Justice Pearson drew to the party's attention last week. Uh, and uh, at paragraph 5.6 of his supplemental judgment, my learned friend says that Lord Gore does not say that a beneficiary under a bear trust has an unqualified right to possession. But my learned friend accepts that Lord Gore does say that there has to be, and I quote, a strong reason to prefer the possessory claim of a trustee to that of a beneficiary. No such strong reason has been shown in this case. Yes, but and whatever. I mean, the, but Attorney General and Lord Gore was a case that was decided in the Court of Chancery. Not there wasn't a decision that common law. No. But my lord, this takes me on actually to my next submission, which is whatever the law at the time of Lord Gore. The right of a beneficiary has since hardened, as the passage in Lewin demonstrates, and the unqualified position as stated in Lewin is supported by the Court of Appeals reasoning in Hodgson. Yes, Marks. but the problem is what, what, what is meant by the statement in Lewin. I mean, able to compel covers the case where you can get a court order. But the very issue in this case arises out of the fact that no court order was obtained. Oh, Lord, yes. We, we submit no court order was necessary. Yeah, but that's not what Lewin says in terms. I mean, that may be, you say that's the implication, but it's not actually what it says in terms. Well, we say it, it's a question of right uh, and obligation, and, and that, that is the position in law, which a court would then recognize. If I can just take you to Hodgson and Mark, which is in the first authorities bundle at tab 10. This was a case in which the claimant, Mrs. Hodgson, had transferred legal title to her house to her lodger, Mr. Evans, to hold as bear trustee. The lodger then wrongfully sold the property on, and so a priority dispute arose between the claimant and the purchaser. On appeal, the claimant was successful. The relevant passage for present purposes can be found in the judgment of Lord Justice Russell on page 116. 116. Bundle. <coughs> and you will see at letter E a passage beginning, I turn first to the question whether, if I could ask the court to read from there to over the page at, at the break between C and D, where he, he finishes with those findings I entirely agree. We rely on the statement that Mrs. Hodgson, the beneficiary under a bear trust, was entitled to occupation. We also rely on the statement that Mrs. Hodgson, as beneficiary, was able to terminate Mr. Evans's presence in the house at will. My learned friend says this was in obiter dicta. We say that takes an unduly narrow approach to what is in obiter dicta. It was the part of the central finding 
first instance, on which Lord Justice Russell then directly based his legal analysis under the 1925 Land Registration Act in the Court of Appeal. In any event, what the trial judge said at first instance, as approved by the Court of Appeal, was simply quite wrong. The same analysis of the possessory rights under a bad trust was adopted by the Law Commission in the project which led to Kulata. And if we go now, I can ask you to put away Authority 1 and go to Authority 3, tab 4. Or 0. Authority 3, tab, tab 40. 40. You will see the Law Commission's report, Transfer of Land and Trusts of Land. And I ask you to go to page 834. And if you could read uh, the paragraph at the foot of the page, just to the end of the page where it says real owner. was judicially approved in 2016. And if we go to... Just yeah. If we now go to authorities 2, tab 30... authority that's relied on 86, as the judge says, is concerned with a trust of shares. Uh, my lord, quite right. Uh, uh, my learned friend says in his supplemental skeleton this wasn't a case about trust of land. That is true. Uh, but this passage is obviously of wider application, and it relies on a law commission report that is specifically about trust of land. <laughs> so, with respect to him, uh, it's not a good if we now go to my learned friend's supplemental, and if I could ask you to go to paragraph 5, I'm just going to take you through the subparagraphs of paragraph 5 in turn. At paragraph, as to paragraph 5.1, I've already taken the court to Lewis. In the last sentence, my learned friend says that the beneficiary under a bear trust cannot give the trustee, and I quote, administrative direction. The right to possession is not the same as a right to give administrative direction. The rule against administrative direction would apply, for example, if there were a bear trust of shares and the beneficiary asked the trustee to actively manage them or if the beneficiary sought to instruct the bear trustee to make improvements to a property or, or to rent it out. That would seek to turn a bear trust into an express trust with active duty. Allowing the beneficiary into the property does not pose the same problem. It does not turn a 
passive bear trust into a trust requiring active management of the trust assets. And in paragraph 5.2, our learned friend then relies on section 6 of Tulasa. And if we go to uh, Supplemental Authorities 3, tab 3, that is, and uh, page 20. You will find section 6 of Tulasa. Uh, and we can see this is about the general powers of trustees. My learned friend accepted this is irrelevant because the breaks were not occupied as trustees, but as trespasses. Further, Section 6 is not about the general right of beneficiaries, which is this case. Further still, there is the savings provision to which my Lord Lord Justice Lewis and my friend, in section 6, subsection 6, we say the beneficiary's right of possession is a rule of equity. Then in paragraph 5.3 of his supplemental skeleton, my learned friend relies on section 12 of Tulata, and you'll find that just by going on 10 pages to page 33. My learned friend says that because he was a trustee in bankruptcy, my learned, Mr. Swift cannot satisfy his son. The conceptual error my learned friend makes is to assume that the relevant trust is one that is created by the bankruptcy, as was the case in the occupational rent disputes considered in French and Bartram, the case in which my learned friend and on which he relies. But this was not a trust created by bankruptcy. But why not? Mr. Swift's possessory right as a beneficiary instead arose as a successor in title, as the successor in title, to the trust created when the partnership acquired the cottage. But why wasn't that a trust created by the Briggs, together with Mrs. Bremer? But, the, but he was the successor in title. Well, the, the trustee would always be the successor in title. Mm -hmm. But it, 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 it was the partnership. It, it, well, partnership it, it doesn't was, have a separate legal personality from the well, partners, does it? It, it wasn't an LLP, well, it was just an ordinary partnership. Well, it, it, it was as a result of the partnership that the Brakes first became trustees. Yes. And it was only once Mr. Swift acquired the partnership interest for the bankruptcy estate, that he obtained a right of possession against the breaks as trustee. It was, it well, I understand, I understand that, but you, you, you were saying, you were trying to distinguish this case from other cases which have considered Section 12 <coughs> on the ground that the breaks didn't create the trust, and that's the bit I'm not entirely following. Well, but, but, what I rely upon is that uh, the trust was created uh, by the partnership agreement yeah. uh, and the uh, partnership then went into liquidation and the liquidators sold the interest, the beneficial interest to Mr. Swift mm. uh, uh, and that is the, the, the relevant analysis and that What's your answer to my Lord's question about the fact that trustees in bankruptcy are always successes in title? Uh, well, they are, my lord, but, but the important thing is on these facts, uh, Mr. Swift had no beneficial interest in the cottage other than the Brakes' proprietary stock exchange, which, as you know, uh, did best in him, but we're not talking about that. The point of the transaction was to reunite the beneficial interest, and so the beneficial interest that belonged uh, to the uh, liquidators 
party that hadn't gone into liquidation, uh, was then assigned to uh, Mr. Swift. And that's how he yeah. obtained it. Uh, and uh, if, uh, if you look at uh, section 12.1a, we see that the question is, what was the purpose of the trust? And the purpose of the trust here is as set out in the partnership agreement. That's the only point. And I'll come back to that later. So as a result, the partnership break first became trustees. It was only once Mr. Swift had acquired the partnership interest in the bankruptcy estate that he obtained a right of possession against the break. And we see that if we go to three paragraphs of the judgment. Can I just ask you, look at these there in the core one, we have five. Sorry, which paragraphs? Uh, paragraphs 125, 175, and 195. And the first one, 125, is on page 83. One two five. What was the other two? Uh, one seven five on page ninety six. One nine five on page one oh one. Yes. The relevant trust is the one originally created. Go to the partnership agreement in a moment, and we'll see that under that trust, plainly, the cottage was available for occupation by the beneficiary or held to be so available. Why else would the partnership buy the cottage? For those reasons, we say that far from being a point for the appellant, section 12 of Pilata actually confirms Mr. Swift's possessory rights as successor in title to the partnership. And the uh, final point on section 12 is that. Well, hold on a minute. The, the, the cases to which Mr. Lermont has referred, or I don't think we've actually been taken to them, say that property is not suitable for occupation by the trustee in bankruptcy. My Lord, uh, absolutely on to the point, and that was the point I was going to, right. to, to, to lose to. Uh, my learned friend says it would be unusual for it to be suitable for a trustee in bankruptcy as the as a beneficiary of a bare trust of land, to occupy that land. To my submission, this question will always depend on the facts of the case. And it would normally be suitable for the trustee to exercise rights of occupancy in order to secure vacant possession for sale, as in this case, uh, so as to maximise value for the estate. The two authorities relied upon my left friend. Sorry, uh, can you just run that one by me again, because I don't understand that. What's vacant possession got to do with occupancy? 
Um, certainly, of course, you want vacant possession to sell the property at the best price. You don't need to occupy a property to get vacant possession of it. You certainly would need to exclude anybody who didn't want uh, to be there. To be sure. That's different. Well, uh, my Lord, in this context, can I just explain that it, it, this by reference to the two authorities that relied on by my late friend, which he didn't actually take you to, which uh, we submit don't support his argument to the contrary. Uh, and at paragraph, uh, I, 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 I suppose the only point, which is obviously an obvious point, is that the, the, the cottage was more valuable vacant than with the brakes there. Uh, uh, paragraph 5.3, which is supplementary, so my late friend refers to Bart Parchin French, and for this, can we go to authorities too? Tab 22. Here's Mr. Dustin's black. And if we go to page 349. I'm sorry, I'm slightly behind. I will catch up. Sorry, my lady. Yeah, it's, uh, it's French and Markham 222. Yes. Tab two, uh, but, uh, but, bundle 2, tab 22, and it's page 349. I am, before we do that, I am, I'm slightly puzzled because these are cases about uh, um, uh, trustees in bankruptcy and whether it's suitable that they should uh, um, have possession stroke take occupation. Uh, usually when there's somebody who's there who's the, the wife of the bankrupt, etc. And it's to do, as Mr. Lerma uh, explained, about uh, whether and to what extent there is uh, compensation of any kind to be made. Um, during the period of the occupation by the spouse uh, into the bankrupt estate. Um, and, and that's what these cases were about. But you've just been telling us, uh, before we got here, um, that actually Mr Swift, although he is a trustee in bankruptcy and has that hat, in fact didn't acquire his interest in this property qua trustee in bankruptcy. He acquired it because he purchased... Uh, that which had not, uh, um, or it was being argued about, uh, whether it had vested in him as trustee in bankruptcy. No, it was in the liquidator of the partnership, save and to the extent that there was a claim in estoppel, etc. Uh, and so I thought you were going to say, and which is why I'm sorry I'm taking so long, I thought you were going to say, but all these cases are therefore irrelevant because uh, he may be a trustee in bankruptcy, but he's not wearing that hat. Not my lady, absolutely. In which and case, I, why I are we... Do, well, I do <laughs> say they're invalid, but I felt it was necessary. Indeed, I, I wasn't intending to deal with this question of suitability for that reason. But I can deal with very briefly to show that these cases don't actually establish what my own friend says they do establish. Okay, so, so, yeah, so that, that's helpful. I haven't lost the thread. No, you haven't at all. Right, so we're so going, we've got up to page 349, French three, four, and nine, nine, Paragraph 18. I apologise. 18. 18 at the foot of it under conclusions. And if I could just uh, ask you to uh, read that paragraph. Going to page 350. about a trustee in bankruptcy being incapable of exercising rights under Section mm. 12. Indeed, Mr. Dusty Blackman appears in that passage to leave open the possibility that a tra trustee in bankruptcy would have rights. Yeah. The other authority relied on Mr. my friend, Mr. Davis is not one to give up points lightly. No, he's not. <laughs> but, 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 I, 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 I would certainly agree. Uh, the other, the other uh, case is Davis and Jackson. Yeah. Well, differently, I think. That, again, simply doesn't support the submission made uh, by my late friend in paragraph 5.3 of his skeleton. Oh, supplemental skeleton argument. If I could just ask you, uh, 
If you look at where he refers to that, at the top of page 3, where he quotes from... Yeah, this is Mr Justice Snow. Is that right? And if I could just ask you to look at supplemental authorities, <coughs> 13... Does, does that submission depend on an implicit assertion that Sheddington is a representative occupier of Mr. Smith, Mr. Swift? Because Mr. Smith, Mr. Swift is not in occupation. As far as we know, he's never set foot in the cottage. My Lord, uh, I don't know the answer to that. But, but no, I, I, can I come on to answer that question yeah. in the next step? But just Un unless you're reading occupation as conferring on a third party the right to occupy, which it may be, uh, maybe what your argument amounts to. Yes, I think it, it effectively does. Yes, as you may think. Uh, uh, that is true. Uh, he's there as the delegate. The Treddington is there as the delegate of Mr. Swift. Uh, 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 but uh, just. Still get, I think it's necessary to, to take you through uh, paragraph 5 of the supplement itself, which sets out uh, the French submission form. So just, just, let me just pause a moment, going back to section 12. You posit this situation, that property is held by trustees, let's say a, a bank, the executor and trustee of an estate, and um, A is entitled to an interest under the trust, and A can then go to the court, can he, and say, I want the trustee to allow my daughter to occupy this property. I am exercising my right of occupation by permitting somebody else to I want possession in order to install my daughter. Well, except that the word in section 12 is occupation rather than possession. Well, occupation. Yeah. Uh, so, Lord, we say the same error as in fact uh, paragraph 5.3 in my letter friend Skeleton, in fact, paragraph 5.4. My learned friend may be right if he were addressing a trust of land created by bankruptcy. It's different when the trustee in bankruptcy is a beneficiary as a successor in title under a pre-existing bear trust. The fact of bankruptcy does not change the nature of the pre-existing beneficiary. If we go to paragraph 5.5, that's simply the point about administrative direction, which I've already addressed. There's nothing in Ingram about the possessory rights of beneficiaries under trusts of land. And I've already addressed paragraphs 
6 times 5.7. And as to paragraph 5.8, the question is not whether Mr. Swift had to ask to be put into possession, but rather whether he was entitled to assert his right to possession against the bear trustee. And the answer to that question is yes, for the reasons I've given here. That is step one of the analysis. Step two is then to ask whether Mr. Swift had to act personally in asserting his right to possession. Did Mr. Swift have to be at the cottage on the 18th of January, James Lott himself, or could he authorise or delegate that right to possession to someone else? The answer is plainly Mr. Swift could have called upon the services of his bailiff or security guards or specialist locksmiths or any other agent chosen by him uh, to take possession on his behalf. Put another way, one can obviously uh, assert and exercise possession through another. Uh, and uh, uh, helpfully, my learned friend uh, conceded this in principle at uh, transcript page 36, <coughs> lines 23 to 25. I will briefly take you to three decisions of the Privy Council which make that clear. Uh, and the first is in Authorities 1, tab 9, case of Russian estates against Pinga. This is an appeal from the Bahamas between competing trespassers, Lord Diplock, gave the advice of the Privy Council, and if I can ask you to go to page 76, between A and B, and to read the sentence in that beginning in the fourth line, if party A can prove a better title than party B, he's entitled to proceed, notwithstanding that C may have a better title than A. If C is neither a party to the action, nor a person by whose authority B is in possession or occupation of the land. In this case, party A would be the Brakes, party B would be Cheddington, and party C would be Mr. Swift. And the second half of that sentence clearly recognises that someone with a right to possession can authorise someone who has no other right to possession to evict a trespass. The second Privy Council decision is in tab 15 of the same bundle. Uh, it is the case of Hume against Kwok, uh, a, a case from Hong Kong in which my Lord Lord Justice Lewison appeared as counsel. Uh, and if we go to page... It was the very last appeal from Hong Kong. <laughs> Significant and interesting. Page 188. If I could ask the court to read from the foot of the page, you'll see where we've put a, a line beside the paragraph that begins in 1955. And if you could read from there to uh, the word licensee between F and G. Five lines below F in the following page. If I could just ask you to read that section.
this was in the context of an application to strike out the limitation that the principle in my submission is clear. By granting a license to the defendant in 1961, the Crown possessed the land through the defendant, whatever the position, before 1961. And the third Privy Council decision is in uh, Authorities 2, uh, tab 31. Uh, this is the Bannerman Town case, uh, which was again uh, an appeal from the Bahamas. And if I could ask you to go to page 579 uh, and to read paragraph. This point of law was squarely made in our submissions at trial. And if I could ask you just to go to the supplemental binding, I believe it's tab 11, our opening submissions. And if you could just confirm it, the, the opening submissions are at tab 11. And then would ask you to go to the paragraphs of 25 and 26, which is 168 of my learned friends in my Bible, but appears to be paragraphs 25 and 26. They may be on page 163. Yes. The court's Bible. If I could just ask you to read those two paragraphs, 25 and 26. closing submissions, and if you could go to tab 13, I think it may be 235, where you should find uh, paragraphs 92 to 95. 92? 92. 232. Sorry, 236. 92 to 95. Yes. If I could ask you to read those paragraphs. Professor Rostell's book is that supplemental authorities tab 16. Yes. The, the relevant analysis in the trial judgment begins at paragraph 195, which is page 101 of the uh, law bundle, tab 5. Could I ask you to read the last sentence of that uh, paragraph? Sorry, which paragraph? 195, at the foot of 101. The last sentence starts on the last line, thirdly, Mr. Swift. And yeah. That uh, and then, uh, if you could go to page, uh, paragraph 199 on page 103.
taking you back to 195, the last sentence in that part, I think answers my Lord or Justice Arnold's question about the finding in the trial judgment about the authority that Mr. Swift gave. Well, this, he says, in accordance with the license document. In 199, it is expressed exclusively in terms of license. Whereas I had understood you to be suggesting that the judge had made a finding of agency. And that was that to which my question was directed. Because you're clearly right to point to 199 as a clear um, application of Bannerman on the theory of a license. But if you're suggesting that there's some alternative reason based on agency, I'm struggling to find it. Oh, well, can I deal with that when I come to the question of the license and the effect of what was done on the 15th of January? I think it's probably the best place for me to begin. OK. Uh, uh, now, uh, 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 the permission hearing uh, before my Lord Lord Justice Arnold, my learned friend Mr. Colcraft made various submissions about vicarious liability. They don't seem to be received it in this court, but I do have the transcript note if you want it. Uh, Who's vicarious liability for what? Well, quite. The, 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 those submissions conflated two entirely different concepts. Vicarious possession, or possession by agency in the law of property, is not the same as vicarious liability in the law of tort, which what the submission is the uh, permission here is uh, making a reference. But my learned friend, Mr. Learmonth, and I think this is probably the, what I need to address, he takes a different approach in uh, para on page six of his supplemental skeleton. He makes three points. First, at paragraph 12, my learned friend says that Mr. Swift had no possessory right which he could delegate. That's step one of the analysis, which I've already addressed. Then at paragraph 13, my learned friend says that vicarious possession is a passive doctrine which allows you to retain a right of possession rather than assert it in the first place. We say that there's no basis in the authority which justifies limiting the doctrine in that way. Once you are satisfied that Mr. Swift had a right to possession against the brakes, plainly he could authorise someone to assert or exercise that right on his behalf. And finally, at paragraph 14, my learned friend appears to concede the point I've just made in response to paragraph 13. But he says the licence in this case did not have that effect. And that is, of course, a step three in the analysis to which I now turn. Uh, uh, and just before I do so, the, the reason I rely on uh, paragraph uh, 195, that last sentence, uh, it, it is because of the, uh, the, the finding of agency it is uh, clearly arising, we say, from the reference to authority. But the judge doesn't use the word agent, does it? He doesn't use that word, my lord, but, but the word... Is 199, as, as we've seen, is all about licence. And you see, that's the point, isn't it? Because... The, the way the judge seems to have viewed the case was through the prism of license, that is to say, a permission which renders lawful that which was otherwise unlawful. Whereas the concept of agency is quite different. Um, it is one person acting on behalf of another, um, in the narrow sense to affect legal relations between the principal and the third party, or at any rate, in a broader sense, to act on behalf of um, the principle in some <coughs> other way. Well, my Lord, it's quite different from licence. We respectfully insist that, that uh, his lordship did not so restrict it in his analysis, and that plainly uh, 
authority. But he, he is tying himself, isn't he, to the license to occupy rather than the letter that was pinned up to the, on the door. I, I, I'm not sure that he is. Can I, can I go on yes. to, to make that commission? Because that, I agree, is important. He, he is committed. To it. That was very much uh, part of his uh, reason. Uh, 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 and we say... But before you uh, do that, at 195, during the last sentence, is Mr. Swift gave authority to Cheddington in the meantime to enter and use the cottage in accordance with the licence document. So uh, are you saying, in fact, there are two... Uh, elements there. There's the license document, but there's authority to enter, which is separate from the license. My lady, yes. I'm uh, sorry um, if that was obvious, but I just no, wanted no, to tease that out. No, 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 you're quite right, my lady, to, to ask the question. Is it my submission? Yes. So that's anterior to the license. You've got to enter before you can use it, according, according to the license. Well, that's right, and that is why the letter uh, and the license have to be taken together. Why does he refer to the letter here? This is in accordance with the license document. Well, he, he, he I'll, I'll find a specific reference to the letter, but he certainly. Uh, I think the argument is that. Um, the sentence should be read, Mr. Swift gave authority to Chellington in the meantime, A, to enter, and B, use the cottage in accordance with the license. He refers to the letter at paragraph 85. So, we say, at as to step three, the intended, indeed the only purpose of the license of the letter, was to allow Cheddington to enter the cottage and exclude the brakes, pending satisfaction of the conditions in the conditional sale contract between Cheddington and Mr. Swift. And the purpose of the license of the letter taken together uh, to exclude the brakes pending completion of the sale has never been disputed. Indeed, the brakes positively made that case at trial. And if we go to the supplemental bond board, tab 10, at what I think is page 118, but it's paragraph 59.2 to 59.4, the brakes Sorry, paragraph? 59.2 to 59.4. What I think is page yes. 118. Yes, it is. On the, 18th, on the 8th of January 2019 at 10.49, that one? Uh, no, yeah. Is that the right paragraph? I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm lost. Where are you? I'm sorry, we're in... Uh,
you go to the page 61. <coughs> By clause 2.1, Mr. Swift authorized Tennyson <coughs> to occupy the cottage, together with anyone else also authorized by him. The brakes, of course, did not fall into the cottage. And Sheddington could only enjoy rights granted to it by Mr. Swift if the brakes were excluded. Because it's entirely clear that the brakes would not have shared possession of the cottage with Sheddington. One need only look at the whole history of this case uh, to demonstrate that. In other words, the license was non-exclusive against Mr. Swift, but not non-exclusive against the brakes. Any remaining doubt as to what Mr. Swift was doing is answered by the letter which Mr. Swift signed at the same time as the motion. And we say that the letter forms an important part of the overall transaction. Uh, indeed, as my Lord Lord Justice <coughs> Lewison said, this is transcript page 38, line 7, the license and the letter are seamless and have to be taken together. Uh, now, the letter is in... Actually, the I think I was suggesting the opposite. <laughs> they weren't seamless. That the letter authorised, or well, might be taken to authorise, Cheddington to enter and take possession, followed by the license, which authorised Cheddington to occupy on a non-exclusive basis with whoever Mr. Smith chose to put in there. I, I understand, my lord, but, but we do submit they have to be taken together yeah. when they're seen as the license. And indeed, we submit that the position set out in this letter, and I, I, if I could ask you to look at it, I think it's page 65 down yeah. that far. It is entirely correct and follows the three steps of the analysis that I've set out. Firstly, in the third paragraph of the letter, Mr. Swift makes the correct point that a successor entitled to the partnership's beneficial interest under the Bear Trust, he was entitled to possession of the cottage. Then in the fourth paragraph, he explains that he has granted the license on the basis of that interest. And in the fifth paragraph, he asked the reader to take the letter as confirmation and evidence that Cheddington is acting with his authority. Well, to be precise, have my authority to enter and use the cottage in accordance with the license to occupy that I have granted. So we can see there the exact basis for the judge's finding in the penultimate sentence of paragraph 155 in his judgment. He's virtually taken it verbatim from this. And the, the, it's, a, it's an authority singular to enter and use the court cottage in accordance with the license to occupy. And he said, and this letter is evidence of my authority. So yes. Authorizing that instance. It's all tied in with the terms of the license, is it not? It, 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 it is uh, a, a seamless transaction in that sense, yes. But it, it, it is making it clear to all the world that he is authorising Cheddington to enter as his agent. Now, in my submission, that analysis is a complete and orthodox answer to ground one of the appeal. If the brakes were not trustees, but strangers, would it work? Would the same argument run? Yes. Hmm? Uh, I believe so. Yes. You do? Yes. Well, that does involve an assertion that licensee or beneficial owner's right is good against the world. I mean, I can understand that you say, well, it's good against the trustees. But is it... You obviously go further than that. You say it's good against anybody. This is my off the cuff answer. I certainly, <laughs> I certainly say it's good against the trustees, but um, I, I, I think.
think if we go back to tab nine of authority, Mr. Wanaka will be after you. He is. Tab, which one? Tab nine. That's of the uh, of authorities one. That's the ocean estate. Page 76. Yeah. And it's that sentence in Lord Titlock. The party A, B, and C analysis works even if there's no trust. Yes, but, but um, on the sort of hypothetical facts of this case, uh, party A is in possession, actual possession, therefore has a possessory title, which is a fee simple. C has no title at law, but merely has a beneficial interest. If we're looking at it in terms of this formula, you say, do you, that C, as beneficial owner, has a better title than the person in possession, even though the legal owner is not party to anything? The, 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 the brakes were there with squatters. And uh, Mr. Swift uh, had his right, had only had his possessory right, because of the trust. So he'd have no rights to delegate. Well, the then, I, then I don't quite follow why all this stuff you've been showing us in Lewin is relevant. I can see that it's relevant as between beneficiary and trustee. And that's why I asked you whether you were confining your submission to title good against the trustee, which the breaks were, or whether you go further and say it would be good against anybody, which is a rather different proposition. Looking at the three steps, uh, you have to have something at step one in order to delegate uh, that at steps two and three. Yeah. Uh, th 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 there was a further argument on ground one about the effect of Dutton, which I've addressed in the skeleton argument. Uh, what we call more modern than that. Paragraphs 44 to 48. But since, of your you've got a, since, well, since you've got our written case on that, I'm giving it time. Uh, and we don't need that. Nobody argument. seems to be relying on Dunn very much, do they? <laughs> we don't need to pre prevail on that. We don't need to rely on that to prevail on ground one. So I wasn't proposing to address the further on it. Hmm. And I'm going to move uh, on to ground two. But before do so, can I just, one point, which is that my learned friend made a lot uh, about the need to apply for a court order. If he's right on ground two, that may be true, as the uh, process points towards a needing to seek a court order. But in the context of ground one, which is concerned with the rights and obligations of, of the parties in to say, a court order is simply recognising those rights rather than creating them. Well, is that true if it's a discretionary remedy? I mean, as I understand it, that's Mr Learmont's point. He says it's not a, not a remedy as of right. It's a discretionary remedy. There we disagree. Not a discussion. Moving on to ground two. The brakes accept that they have a number of hurdles to jump over in order to succeed on ground two. We summarise them at paragraph 21 of our skeleton argument. In the core, on the page, tab 13. 
13, page 165. Sorry, it was paragraph? Uh, paragraph 21. Thank you. <coughs> Your paragraph 22 goes, though, doesn't it? That's the one about owner. Yes, we, we've just summarised the, the, the points in 21. And, yeah. and I was simply going on to say, and I've addressed point one already, we accept that point all the way yeah. in 20 successful on ground one. Uh, we essentially make that point in the last sentence of, of paragraph 22. That leaves three other points. First, was there a relevant licence under the 1977 Act? Second, if so, was it an excluded license? And third, was the judge perverse or irrational to find that the brakes were not in residence at the cottage rather than the house? I go to uh, uh, my own sentence for today, which deal with the third point. If I could uh, deal with the first point, we submit that the 1977 Act applies to leases and to licenses operating at common law in a way comparable to leases. That is obvious from the context in which the legislation was passed. Uh, and for your note, we give the reference footnote 10 of our skeleton argument, which is uh, 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 on the same page in my book, it's 165. It's also obvious from the title of the Act, this is about protection of addiction from addiction. It has nothing to do with fiduciary duty. The permission given in the partnership agreement was of an entirely different nature. Nothing to do with possession or trespass at common law, or with conferring something equivalent to a lease. It was instead regulating the brakes by fiduciary obligations as partners. And for those reasons, we respectfully endorse the reasoning of the judge at paragraphs 127 to 133. Well, I appreciate the distinction you made between fiduciary duty and, and the common law position. I understand that point. But why do you say that that's got nothing to do with the policy of the Act? Because if they get a right of occupation as a result of an equitable licence, for want of a better expression, um, why isn't that good enough? Because the purpose of the Act is to stop people being summarily evicted without a chance to have it, court having the chance to consider the position. Well, my Lord, the, the short answer, which I hope I can develop uh, to your satisfaction, is that they do not uh, get a right of occupation from this uh, license, the partnership agreement. Uh, and the license doesn't confer any occupation. It's about fraud. If I can ask you, the, the, the judgment which we rely on is at paragraphs 127 to 123, that's pages 83 to 85. And uh, if I could ask you to go to the partnership agreement, which is in, I believe, tab one of the supplemental. And 8.4 says entitled to reside in the premises as licensees. Well, so that doesn't give rise to a right of occupation. Uh, my lady, what uh, what I uh, have shown you is that this agreement, uh, the particular clause 
uh, is in the section about drawings and it's dealing with the no profit um, but uh, I just want I don't to think that's in that dispute but uh, you, you, you summarise the position if I may say so very clearly in your skeleton argument paragraph 25 um, last sentence you say the purpose of clauses 8.4 and 8.5 to make it clear the breaks could take the benefit of partnership property by living in the house or the cottage rent free without reduce, reaching their fiduciary duties so absolutely it's without breaching their fiduciary duties <coughs> but the object of it is to enable them to live in the cottage rent free which the context of, this uh, of course, the rent-free point comes up comes again up. later. Yeah. But, well, let me just take you through the partnership agreement, because in, in our submission, uh, the license in that agreement is not directed at possession, it's directed at, at, at the profit. So Are you saying the board doesn't give any right to possession? Not saying that. Right. Does it need to? If it's a license? No. An ex hypothesis license doesn't give you exclusive no. possession. No. So as long as you've got the right to occupy somewhere as a dwelling under a license, you're with your prima facie at any rate within the nineteen seventy seven Act. Well, my lord, we say when when this agree when the license that is referred to by this agreement is relied on, uh, that it is that that is not the purpose of the license <coughs> given by this agreement. But l let me just I'll take you through this provision. That's what you mean by purpose. purpose. But anyway, uh, the. the Parties uh, and the background on page five, and then the definitions of the partnership business, which goes to the point that I made earlier about the nature of the bad trust for the purpose of section 12. When you go over the page, I ask you to note the definition of. Uh, partnership, property and premises uh, and you will see that the premises are to be occupied by the partnership which again supports the section 12 point I made earlier and then before we go to the body of the document can I ask you to look at the schedule page 27 is Schedule 1. We see the Brakes and Patleywood Farm are to share profits two thirds, one third, only after the Brakes have first drawn £100,000 effectively as salary. Then at page 30, Schedule 4. You see the premises of the date of the agreement constitutes only the farm, not also the cottage, that's because the cottage hadn't been acquired at that stage. And then Schedule 5, Part 1, you, on page 31, you see the partnership property. <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, am I misunderstanding? I, 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 I had got the impression from what we were told earlier that the farm comprised the house and the cottage, and that's how, why we see in 8.5, West Axe and all the cottage forms part of the premises. My lord, no, that wasn't correct. At the time this agreement was entered into, the cottage didn't comprise. Well, there were different titles, apart from anything else. As far as I understand it, the Brakes owned the farm, and the three of them acquired the cottage. The that's Brakes right. and Mrs. Bramer acquired the cottage under a separate title, after the partnership deed was signed, <coughs> but the partnership deed was signed in anticipation of the acquisition of the cottage. Exactly. Uh, 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 so then going to the body of the, uh, of the page 8. Page 8. Page 8, we see clause 4. 
where the brakes are taken to have contributed four million pounds to the partnership and the ALP was to contribute in total two million, which reflects the two thirds, one third distinction we saw in, saw in Schedule 1. And then some of the LLP's capital provided under Clause 4.2 was to be used to acquire and renovate the cottage. And if one goes to page 17... That's in the deed, is it? Uh, page, yes, 17. Indeed, if, I, if you can go to clause 19.1a. Oh, yes, I see. And then on page, going back to page 9, clause C, 6, we see the operative provision for profits and losses. Carefully booked to the partner's current accounts once the partner's accounts are approved. And then clause 12 on page 12, we see a heading Duties and Power, which provides at 121F that the partner should account to the partnership if they derive any personal benefit from the business, the partnership name, and critics partnership property. So pausing there without more, had the brakes lived in uh, the farm, schedules four and five on pages 30 and 31, or the cottage once purchased, they would have had to account it for that benefit to the partnership. And it's against that context that one then goes to the drawings provision on page 10. Clause 8.1 deals with the £100,000 annual sum to be paid for the break we saw referred to in Schedule 1. And you will see in the fifth line that that can be paid in kind. Clause 8.2 then deals with repayment of excess drawings. Clause 8.3 sets the outer limit of the drawings. And clause 8.4 contains the provision that the brakes can stay in the premises rent free. A, a very minor point um, that uses the word licensees, leaving aside the misspelling, with a capital L as if it were a de 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 defined term. But in fact, so far as I can see, it's not a defined term. Am I right? I think you're right. Yeah. Uh, now, we saw the definition of premises. Discussed. It didn't include the cottage because it hadn't yet been acquired. Just, just, just hold on a minute. We, we're told by the deed that profits are to be split, which is clause 6, in the ratio set out, set out in the schedule. Schedule is two thirds, one third. As you rightly say, 8.1 says that can be payment in kind. But if the founding partners, that is the breaks, do take up the entitlement to reside in the premises license, rent, as licensees rent free under 8.4, there is no adjustment to the profit share. So they are not, to that extent, being paid in kind. That's right. They're entitled to their two thirds, whether they take up that option or not. Exactly. And uh, no doubt that is the reason why it was put in. Uh, and the, the, the clarification in relation to the cottage, uh, you will see, is offered by the first sentence of clause 8.5. And in the context of the drawing provision and the wider duties of the partnership, 8.4. Whole of eight is clearly regulating their fiduciary duties. 8.4 is, 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 as my Lord uh, Augustine used to just say, is excluding this benefit in kind from the assessment of what drawings the brakes could make uh, uh, from uh, the partnership. Uh, 
And what in your submission is the effect of the inclusion in 8.4 of the words as licensees? We've established it's not a defined term. We ignore the misspelling. But what is the effect of it? That they uh, were entitled to reside in the premises for the uh, purposes of the partnership. Your submission seems to amount to saying we should ignore those words. I don't believe so. Uh, it, it is it, it, the whole point of the license is the permission to allow them to reside there, um, and for that not to uh, constitute a payment in kind. And at common law, uh, as the registered owners, the brakes could not be trespasses on the farm or the cottage. So we submit they couldn't grant themselves licenses. They didn't. To excuse that term. Did they? The founding uh, partners, or the three partners, gave them the license? Uh, my lord, yes. Yeah. But we, that, that's a point that we made <coughs> in our skeleton, which uh, the learned Dunn uh, also referred to, that the proposition one takes from Harrison, Gordy, and Smith. Uh, we respected that the judge was correct in finding there was no license for the purposes of the 1977. If contrary to those conditions, there was a license. We say it was an excluded license for the purposes of the Act, and that's our second point. <coughs> Your uh, obviously tremendous the structure of the Act, Section uh, 3.1, uh, contains the relevant prohibition on tenancies, 3.2b extends the prohibition to licensing mm. other than exclusive licensing yeah. and 3A7. And well, it obviously wasn't granted for money, but you have to say it wasn't granted for money's worth. That's right. Uh, uh, and the, the key word in section 3A7 and 3A4, the policy of the 77 Act is only to protect a license if you have paid for that. We say that the brakes didn't do that, and the permission that was given to them to occupy uh, was to act in a way which otherwise, if they hadn't had that permission, would have constituted a breach of fiduciary duty. And it was in return. Now, the leading authority on subsection 7 is the decision of the Divisional Court in Svelberg, to which my learned friend... So, so, you are saying, let me try and get this right, you are saying that all that Clause 8.4 did was to exonerate the brakes from what would otherwise have been a breach of fiduciary duty, and that cannot be characterised as money's worth. Is that how you put it? it exactly. Uh, and the unlawfulness which this licence is directed at is about benefiting uh, from fiduciary property without accounting.
can address you on snell grounds. Uh, that's on authorities one, Pat 17. My learned friend says uh, the divisional court wrongly applied uh, the provisions in section 3 to section 1 of the Act. In my suggestion, even if he's right about it doesn't falsify uh, using the analysis the court uh, adopted for section two. Uh, and if, if one looks at the headnote in uh, uh, page 265, under held, under halfway down the page, Such money as passed between the parties was payment for services only, not a charge for the occupation of the property. The license was not for money or money's worth, and was an exclusive license. If then one drops down to Mr. Justice Kirsty's judgment on page 266, at Roman numeral 4, in the middle of the page, you can see that the payments that were made, that were made were for utilities and food, rather than for occupation. Then if you go over to page 267, uh, can I ask you to read the section we've marked with the line in the margin down to the end of the third line from the bottom of the page. No, the error is that section 3A, which Mr Justice Curtis is now considering, has got nothing to do with section 1, which was the section under which the offence was charged. You say it doesn't affect the analysis. So you say this is simply over to reasoning on a point that was irrelevant. It doesn't apply to that. Yeah. And then moving on to Lord Justice Simon Brown's on page 269. Can I ask you to uh, read the section that we've marked in the mark? It's a bit ironic. It was the court that drew the party's attention to Section 3A, and the court didn't notice that it didn't apply to Section 1. It just shows you the danger of judges having clever ideas. <laughs> and the position in this case I just, I, leaving aside the point about section one, and I understand your position on that, but the question in this case was all about what the money was for. I mean, there was no dispute that money was paid. Um, and the question was, what was the money for? But that's not the question we're faced with. The question we're faced with is quite the opposite. In our case, there's no dispute that no money was paid. The question is whether the, what was provided was for money's worth. Yes. So how does this case help us? Well, <coughs> my lord, it, 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 it is a, 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 an example of the circumstances in which uh, what was alleged to be money for money's worth uh, was not. But I, I accept that the facts of this case are, are different to those of the facts which, on which I'm now about to address. I have already and, and, and again to make good. Clause 8.4 states in terms the license is rent free. They contracted on the basis that they would not pay for the license 
we say that is a complete answer. And the learned judge was wrong on that point. That page one eight, that paragraph one eight four on page ninety nine. We file the respondents later. On that. My learned friend drew a distinction between payment in terms, payment of rent in terms of money and payment in kind, which I understood his submission, he suggested, would not be done. Uh, with respect, he's wrong on that. Uh, rent can include uh, payment of certain services. And I brought uh, two pages of Megarian Way, which I'd like to hand up, which make it clear that rent is taken to include performance of services. So, you, so your argument is that we should interpret the words rent-free in a partnership agreement as meaning not only that no money need to change hands, but that the breaks need do nothing in return for occupation. Well, that, the, that's, that, was that this, any services they performed uh, in uh, the context of was not for the property, it was for the partnership. And so it would not and be... I suppose you say, well, their obligations towards the partnership were exactly the same, whether they took up the right in at Clause 8 4 or not. Their drawings from the partnership were exactly the same, or their profit, their share of profits in the partnership was exactly the same, whether they took up Clause 8 4 or not. And therefore, there was nothing they were giving in return. <coughs> they weren't providing any service. No. As a, as a 
property. And, and uh, indeed, I think most of the paragraph to which my Lord and Justice Smith refer to in the judgment says that actually at a certain, in a certain time, uh, Saracen paid for those, uh, paid that money. So that, that That's why I'm a subject, you're dropping your voice. Sorry, I, I, don't, I don't think I need, you, you already have the point, I don't think I need yeah. to make any more. Um, so, even if you were against this, on that point that we raised in the respondent's notice, which we submit is a good one, uh, we submit the judge was right when he said at paragraph 187 that the brakes contributions to the partnership were to do with the partnership business and not specifically to do with occupation of the cost. We also respectfully endorse paragraph 188. The point is, as my learned friend said, you have to ask ultimately whether this case was the kind of case Parliament intended to protect. In other words, whether the breaks fell within the equity of the statute. And we submit the judge was correct to find that the 1977 Act uh, should not protect squatting. This is effectively what he has said. No, he hasn't, with respect. He said some sort of different license. Well, his, his, his finding. Uh, and, his and the finding. Act plainly is designed squatters in the sense that they are people who continue in residence after whatever legal right they had to be there has come to an end. Well, I mean, you can call them squatters if you like, but or trespassers if you like, but that's what they are. Brings us back to, to what was the nature of this license. Yeah. And I, I've made this motion for now. I, I mean, unless, unless the what had been an excluded license is replaced Sorry, I know something which was not an excluded license has actually been replaced by something which is. I find it difficult to see how the judge can be right in paragraph 188. And even if he is right, then you've got to confront Mr. Learmont's argument. Well, as long as there's been a qualifying license, if I can use that expression, at some time in the past, then section 3 bites. I don't think I'll, given the Right. I'm not going to. I think I've gone as far as I need to go yes. in relating to paragraph 140. And that leaves the residence issue. Residence, yes. Which uh, could I ask Mr. Day to address? Please? Yeah. My lords, my ladies, um, as you're aware, this only arises if you're not with us on there being no license. Mm -hmm. You're not with us on this being an excluded license. And the question then is whether the brakes were in residence at the cottage when the license came to an end, which we say is on the 15th of January 2019, uh, and whether they were in residence when Chillington took possession on the 18th of January 2019. Given there's only three days between it, it may be that there's not very much in, in the position of between the 15th and, and the 18th. And I make five submissions on this residence point. The first is that there is a conceptual difference between being in possession of a house and residing there. They are different concepts and they involve different tests. Mm. And it doesn't take exceptional circumstances, as my learned friend puts it at paragraph 18 of his supplementary skeleton argument, for one to possess a house but not reside there. The question of residence is to be considered separately, the question of possession and a finding of possession doesn't lead to any sort of presumption as to residence. So that's the first point. The second point is that none of the judge's primary findings of fact are being challenged on this appeal, only his evaluation of those facts. Uh, and that's important because there, in my, there are, in my submission, some findings on the primary facts which are decisive on the question of residence. And if we could go to the judgment uh, in the core volume at tab 5. 
page 58. My learned friend took you to paragraph 50. Yeah. Can I just draw your attention to the last line of paragraph 49? 49? 49. The, last, the last line of paragraph, of paragraph 49. The point is that the brakes stayed overnight at the cottage. Yes. Not where they wanted to, but only when they absolutely had to. Yeah. And that's what then, then leads the judge into the conclusion. Uh, 60, he says they hated staying there. Uh, exactly. And he returns to that theme later in the judgment. You can see at paragraph 54 on page 60 uh, that Mrs. Brake expressed an interest in buying the cottage after their dismissal. And then at paragraphs 59 and 60 on page 62, the judge then makes findings as to the motivations for the Brake's bid for the cottage. If I could just ask you to read paragraphs 59 and 60 on page 62. rejection of the evidence from Mrs. Brake about the explanation for bidding for the cottage. He finds the motive for bidding the cottage was instead to give the Brakes more leverage in their dispute over the cottage after. So the unchallenged findings for the purposes of this appeal are the Brakes hated having to stay in the cottage for weddings. They only stayed in the cottage when they absolutely had to. And they bid for the cottage only as leverage in their dispute with Dr. Guy. And I'll come back to the importance of those points when I address the authorities in a moment. But just to pick up on one point that my learned friend said, the, the judge did not find that the Brakes were in residence as at the date of their dismissal. He said that their residence had ceased. He didn't put a date on it. Uh, so, so strictly speaking, there isn't a finding on that. But we do say, for reasons that I'll show you in a minute, that there was a, a fundamental change in the Brakes' approach to the cottage once they were dismissed. And the judge had all of that evidence at trial, and I'll give you a couple of brief references to that in a moment. But that's the second point. The third point is that the evidence which the judge um, had uh, to assess in relation to the question of uh, residence was considerable. Uh, and with respect, my learned friends haven't engaged with any of it. Uh, and for your note, we've given some of the documentary evidence um, uh, in the supplemental bundle at tabs uh, 6, 7, 8, and 9. We gave references, page references to that at paragraph 29 of our skeleton article. And those are all statements by the Brakes before the 18th of January 2019 that they considered the cottage was not fit for habitation and they could not move there from the house despite being dismissed by um, Dr. Guy. Yeah. Now, um, for present purposes, I wanted to draw your attention to some of the other evidence briefly in our closing submissions. Uh, that's in the supplementary authorities of uh, tab 13. Supplementary bundle. Thank you, Rain. Pardon? Supplementary Green. bundle. Supplementary bundle. Apologies. I'll, I'll use the internal pages because I think we're out. The first reference is uh, internal page 3. feeds into what the judge uh, says when he reaches his conclusion on residence in the judgment. If you just open up tab 5 of the core bundle as well, and you look at paragraph 50, page 59, he makes a point towards the uh, bottom of 50, describes as a footnote, that in the possession proceedings, the break's positive case was the action on the house rather than the cottage was their principal and sole residence. And my, my lords and my, my lady may recall the possession trial and the eviction trial were back to back. Yeah. So the judge had tried three weeks of possession, three weeks of eviction. And one of the reasons for case managing it in that way was that so that a consistent view could be reached as to what the were saying about where they lived. Then if we uh, go back into the Closing um, submissions. Uh, if we go on to um, page, <coughs> internal page 
well. And I'll ask you just to skim subparagraphs one to three. So Mrs. Brake's oral evidence at trial was that she hated moving to the cottage and that text messages disclosed in the trial bundle demonstrated that she considered it to be a crap shack, a dump and cold. And then at uh, subparagraph 5 on the next page, you'll see the evidence about Mrs. Brake stopping uh, using the cottage after her dismissal. And there are similar uh, passages in, in this part of the closing submission dealing with Mr. Brake and uh, Mr. Darcy. Uh, if we could then jump to uh, paragraph 44 of the closing, which is on page 23. This is summarising the evidence of the housekeeper. There was a housekeeper that maintained both um, the other properties in the farm and also the cottage. But can I just ask you to read from 44 over the page to 46, please? We then address the position on the evidence extensively at paragraphs 100 to 101. Uh, I won't take you through all of it, but I'd just ask you to read one other quote from evidence, an unchallenged evidence at trial, and that's on internal page 45. And you'll see a, a reference to the evidence of Mr. Lyons. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lyons was the security guard who entered. Yeah. Can I just ask you to read that uh, evidence which goes over the page? Well, then the judge quotes all this. Mm. I, I believe he's summarising it anyway. Yes. So, so the evidence before the judge at trial, as we say in paragraph 102, um, when he made the no residence was that the cottage had no food, no milk, no clothes in any drawers, no duvet covers, no sheets, no toilet paper, no towels, no toothbrushes, no cleaning products, and a boiler that didn't work and hadn't been fixed despite the fact it was winter. Yeah. So that, that's my third point, and leads me into my fourth point, which is that the judge's conclusion as to residence is the type of evaluative finding which the court should only disturb. Well, that's a very obvious point for you to make, and I understand it, but before you get into any further into that, um, I mean, maybe you're going to deal with it later, in which case, fine. But what do you say mm -hmm. about the undertakings given on the 17th of January? I, I am going to deal with that. Fine. Um, uh, right at the end. I mean, my punchline is, as it were. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, my, 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 my fourth submission is about, about this being an, an evaluative finding. Yeah. My Lord Lord Justice Lewis and my Lady, Lady Justice Aspen will remember there was a similar debate in the last appeal about conclusions as to reasonable expectations of privacy. It's a debate we often encounter. It, it, it is. Can I just give you two references to make that good in this context? The first is in Gopher of Investment, which is in Authorities 1. Well, it goes all through these Rent Act authorities. It's all said to be a jury question, question of fact, one of fact and degree, all sorts of things. A, a common sense question as yeah. to where the home is. Yeah. Um, or a jury question, as you say, my lord. Um, in, in which case, can I just give you the, the references for yeah. our notes in case it persists later on? Um, the the go for investments reference is that authorities one, tab 11, 
page 129, uh, and in particular we rely on the last bit of Lord Justice Ken's uh, judgment and the first part of Lord Justice Lawton's mm. judgment, which are both on page 129. And that's then picked up by the Court of Appeal more recently in the Islington and Boyle case. Uh, and perhaps I could just show you that very briefly. That's authorities too. Tab 25, page 419. 409? 419. Thank you. Sorry, what is 22, you say? Sorry, it's tab 25. 25. 419. see the reference to go for a paragraph 51 and then Lord Justice Etherton then translates that into kind of the modern test at paragraph 52. Yes. Now, in fact, maybe this would be a, a good moment to deal with my, my Lord Lord Justice Arnold's question about the undertakings. Uh, now, the undertakings were to go to the cottage when there was a wedding on in the house. That evidence was, of course, before the judge, uh, and he made extensive references to it uh, during the course of his judgment, and extensive references were made to it during the course of the three-week trial before him. The, the judgment references are uh, core uh, tab 5, pages 69 to 71. Uh, so the question isn't whether the judge um, simply ignored this. It's a question of weight. My respectful submission, an argument about giving grace well, and weight well, to the undertaker. It surely goes a bit further than that. On the 17th of January, there was a hearing before the court at which the position of both parties was that the brakes should go and live in the cottage when appropriate. That was the position being insisted upon by your client, and it was accepted by the brakes. And that necessarily implies that the cottage was there for them to go to. And yet, at the same time, your client was busy taking steps forcibly to evict them and did so the very next day. And is your submission that that has absolutely nothing to do with the question of whether they were in residence the next day? Not, not nothing to do. I don't go that far. I say it's a, it's a question of how much weight you put on Set against all of the other evidence to which. Well, where does the judge address himself to that question? I mean, it's true, it's part of his narrative, but where does he consider the question of the impact of the undertakings on the question of residence? I, I, I can't point to a particular part of the trial judgment where he does that. No. But he sets out the factual background, which includes the undertakings. Uh, and uh, and it, 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 in my submission, it would be unfair given that he expressly quotes the undertakings and deals with them and deals with the hearing uh, uh, to suggest that he didn't take it into account at all. And, and in that regard, I would rely on what my, my Lord, Lord Justice Lewis, had said recently in the Volpe and Volpe decision. Uh, that's it, Authorities 338. I might be worth just turning up briefly given the question um, from my Lord, Lord Justice Arnold. That's uh, Authorities 3, tab 38, page 820. judgment, uh, I would um, I would obviously rely on all, all of it, uh, and there's a similar passage at the start of the judgment where my Lord Lord Justice Lewis makes the point that trial judgment judges can always express themselves more clearly, um, but that's not the test. Well, I think, your, I think your real point is the one that's summarised in paragraph 2.3 of this judgment. Your court's bound, unless compelling reason to the contrary, to assume the trial judge has taken the whole of the evidence into his consideration. The mere fact he doesn't mention it doesn't mean he overlooked it. Yes, uh, precisely, my lord. And at paragraph two, you make a similar point about. Um, um, and that I think comes from Henderson and Foxworth, if I remember rightly. I, I'm happy to um, yeah. um, your lordship's judgment, not go any further back. 
So, so we respectfully submit that notwithstanding the undertaking, and there is a, a, another point of law which I will come to on the undertaking at, at, at the very end, that the judge was well within the ambit of conclusions mm. that could reasonably be re reached given the findings in the judgment, not just as to the undertaking, but also that the brakes hated the cottage. He never went there unless they absolutely had to. They hadn't stayed in the cottage for months before Teddington took possession, and they only bid to acquire the cottage to use as leverage in the dispute. Uh, and the fact of the undertaking's in fact, to change that analysis, the brakes were undertaking to go to the cottage, not to live there, but simply to permit a wedding to happen in the house. They were not undertaking to go back into the cottage to live there permanently. They were willing to go there for weekends for a limited purpose, which was to permit weddings to happen in there. And in my um, respectful submission, the judge's conclusions, given that evidence, uh, you might disagree with them, but they're certainly not perverse or irrational in light of the whole body of the evidence, some of which I've just taken you to, the judge was fully entitled to come to that conclusion. My fifth and final point is on the authorities. And of course, there are a considerable number of my learned friend very fairly took a uh, report through them, uh, th uh, through them uh, before the short adjournment. Uh, in the time um, remaining, can I um, just focus on the three authorities that my Lord Augustus Lewis raised with and just flag the yes, but you do, don't right. forget that Mr. Learmont has raised an additional point, which is that all this is irrelevant because the brakes were in residence at the house. My Lord, uh, yes, and at that point, I'm very happily passing the baton back to my leader. Oh, I see. To deal with that point <laughs> um, before finishing. Um, so just just beginning with um, Beck and Schultz, if I may. That's in the supplementary authorities at, at tab thirteen, tab eight. Sorry. Page 59. Yeah. Can I ask you to read um, in the middle of the page the passage beginning, nevertheless, uh, all, all the way down, if I may, to um, the next page, um, five lines into the next page, please. Possibly. sense the fact that the judge didn't refer to authorities uh, it isn't by itself a basis for impugning the judgment unless you were satisfied that he didn't approach <coughs> the question of residence as a matter of common sense. So that, that's Beck and Schultz uh, and uh, it certainly established from that case that occupation of a house for occasional visits doesn't amount um, to occupation as a home. If we then go to regalian securities that's in tab nine of the same bundle go to page 70. We'll see in the, in, in the middle of the page um, references to various authorities, including Beck and Schultz. And then can I ask you to, uh, to read the next, um, the next five or six lines, please? I'm sorry, where? On page 17? So page 17, in the middle of the page, he refers to the previous authorities. And then can I just ask you to read the sentence? One of the problems, one of the problems examined. examined. Thank you. In these cases of two homes. So it, it, again, the question is whether occasional use can elevate possession of a property up to a, to residence. Uh, and again, to answer my, my Lord Lord Justice Arnold's question about the undertaking. The undertakings were for a very limited purpose. They were to enable the brakes to go to the cottage, to make real weddings in the house, and then to return to the house. So, in my submission, the authorities assist uh, on that question. 
question. And then um, finally, and just to draw it together, it's a supplementary authorities 10, tab 10, sorry, Hampstead decision and Lord Brandon's judgment. Uh, and within that, uh, just two um, short passages that, that draw those points together. The first is at page 82. It's Proposition 3 at the foot of page 82. Where a person owns one dwelling house which he occupies as his home for most of the time and is at the same time a tenant of another dwelling house which he only occupies rarely or for limited purposes. It's a question of fact and degree. Lord Brandon then returns to that, that, that theme, as it were, when applying <coughs> the principles to the facts of that case at page 84. And then he concludes if one treats the question as one of fact and degree as the authorities require that a court should do, it is, in my opinion, impossible to conclude that the limited use of a flat made by the tenant was sufficient to make the flat the second home. So, on, on those authorities, the question is whether the fact and degree of the breaks occasional use of the cottage after their dismissal and in light of the undertaking, made it a place of residence sufficient to justify protection under the 1977 Act. And particularly, the question on these authorities is whether the judge's evaluation of that question was perverse yeah. within the ambit of um, conclusions he could reasonably reach for the reasons I didn't want to say it was within that ambit. Uh, unless I can assist you further on the factual question of residence, I'm happy to go to the my lord and my lady, can I finally address the new point? Yes. Uh, I didn't want to interrupt my learned friend Flo, which is why I mean, I want to make the submission to any essay. But as a matter of procedure, we do object to the fact that this point was taken at 10 30 last night uh, in circumstances where it didn't pleaded, not raised at the trial, which is nowhere in the grounds of appeal or the skeleton argument or the supplemental statement. So we say it's procedurally important to raise it now. The answer on the substance. We saw earlier that the word premises in the partnership agreement is a contractually defined term referring to both the farm and the cottage. The meaning of the word the premises in fact is not a question of contract, but rather a question of what Parliament intended. We say that properly construed, <coughs> Parliament intended to refer to a single dwelling house. That construction is clear from the words chosen by Parliament, and it's worth turning to the statute briefly. It's in Supplemental Authorities, tab 1. Well, it's got to be let as a dwelling, singular. Uh, 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 exactly, my lord. Uh, if I could just ask you to look at page 5. Yeah. Uh, uh, and The is in section 31B uh, in the statute for a reason. So is the phrase, and I would be addressed to those who refer to at the start of section 31, premises let us a dwelling. By using the singular a dwelling, the premises, Parliament was intending to refer to and protect a particular dwelling if that particular dwelling was resided in by the tenant or licensee. How does this in work in the case that Mr. Leonard referred to of the shop over the flat? Well, uh, uh, Sorry, the flat over the shop. Yes, well, look, in, in, in that context, the phrase or part of them in section 31b is referring to part of the relevant dwelling. I think, so the, answer to, I think the answer to my Lord's question is under ancient Rent Act jurisprudence, when you let a shop with an overlying flat in a single building together, that counted as being let as a dwelling. There's a wealth of learning in the Gary on the Rent Act on what this wretched phrase means, which so I'll say, bedeviled my early years of practice. But no, so the, mi the mixed premises of shop and um, flat was plain. It was, I think, Epsom Grand Stand and something or other of the 1920s established that. I'm grateful for that erudition. But 
Now, I think there are, again, rent act cases on you know, two houses let together and goodness knows what. But um, I mean, We would have looked at this, frankly, yeah. if it didn't have a charge. But, but you haven't had an opportunity. But, but, but the way I, I was going to say, or part of what I was going to say, is, is that that might be a self-contained flat uh, occupied by a tenant within a larger house, for example, or, or it might be where the tenant is only living in a few rooms in the house. Here, there can be no doubt that the relevant premises are the cottage, because that is the dwelling in respect of which statutory protection is sought. The words, or part of them, cannot be used, as my own friend attempts to do, to point to an entirely different dwelling, such as the farmhouse. If it assists, and thus be on note, the geography of the two dwellings and their respective ownership history is set out in some detail in the trial judgment. Uh, uh, the cottage is on the other side of the road. From th there's farms, a particularly so. useful... My, my Lord, yes, can, can I just repeat yeah. again, just for your notes, there's a particularly useful summary and a map in the section 283A trial judgment, which is in the authorities bundle 3, at tab 34, page 612, right. paragraphs 2 to 8. And when you look at the map, <coughs> the house is, 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 is number 1, and the cottage is number 2 in his lordship's uh, description. And you'll see, uh, uh, I think as my lord said, that they're across the road. So it's the first authority in, in bundle three. The conceptual error made by my learned friend is to assume that the word premises is to be given the same meaning in both the partnership agreement and yeah. the statute. And what the parties intended to, uh, that word to mean in the partnership agreement says nothing about what Parliament intended uh, uh, the word to mean for the purpose. Now, can I move on to the subject of uh, remedy? If you are not with us on grounds one and two, there's the question of remedy, which is ground three. And there is the question of whether a possession order ought to be made, given that the brakes are at best adverse possession. And there's also the question about how damages You have seen the letter sent to the court mm. yesterday by the new trustees, the trustees of the bankruptcy court. Uh, uh, we submit that, that on any view, if either of grounds one or two is successful, the question of damages will need to be remitted to the judge. That was an issue for trial, and the evidence was before the trial. So it would only require a short further hearing. If the trustee in bankruptcy wants to assert a proprietary interest in damages, that would be their opportunity to do so. A and in my submission, as a matter of case management, it would make sense for the judge to deal at the same time with the question of any order for possession and whether that should be made, having heard from the beneficial owner. Th these are issues which need to be properly ventilated. Uh, first of all, and God forbid, if necessary, appealed, rather than dealt with for the first time on appeal. Uh, unless I can leave any further answers to the court. Right. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Limon. My Lord, if I can start at the wrong end, as it were with the 1977 Act, if we get there. Um, I note my learned friend barely mentioned the Harrison, Broadley and Smith point in his um, submissions, and I, and I take it that his to all intents and purposes abandoned. The um, excluded license point, it was rephrased as a license being 
a license being an exoneration for accounting for the benefit of residing, which they would otherwise have to account for. Sure, we accept that. That's restating what the judge held in rejecting the primary submission, that it was not a rent for money or money's worth. The reason they're being exonerated is because of the value the breaks are giving by their services and their contributions under the partnership agreement, that whole par parcel of consideration described by the learned judge. On the new point, the or, or part of it uh, point, uh, premises is a contractually defined term under the license and a, uh, under, under the partnership agreement and the license is a contract. It, it is up to the parties to define what they mean by premises. My own friend says the act is different and that dwelling singular therefore excludes any um, license in respect of more than one dwelling. But uh, it, uh, with respect, that doesn't help. The Interpretation Act 1978, which has retrospective effect for these purposes, in fact, its predecessor, the Interpretation Act 1889, I think it was, <coughs> um, says the same thing that singular includes the plural unless a contrary intention appears in the statute. I think you'll find that the rent tax cases say there is a contrary intention. I have well. a look. <laughs> an ancient dog-eared copy of McGarry. <laughs> um, but, the, but in any event, the geographical point about it being two dwellings doesn't really help because this isn't a shop and a flat above. It's an, an urban setting like the typical case. This is a license relating to a landed estate, a manor, in effect, with its curtain. Well, it, does, it does matter with respect. Your new point is it doesn't matter that the breaks on the judge's findings were not resident in the cottage, provided that they were resident in the house. Yes. Um, and for that purpose, you have to say that... The premises include... The premises that, that the house and the cottage were let as a dwelling, or held on a license equivalent to letting as a dwelling. So it does matter. But as long as they're in residence in some part of the premises... If the premises were let as a dwelling, yes. What we're talking... The premises we're talking about is, is as I say, a landed estate, a manor with its curtilage and its outbuildings and mm -hmm. its ancillary accommodation. And that's what this is. Yeah. It's the, it's the, it, it, it might not be the typical 1977 Act case, but nonetheless, the wording is perfectly apt to apply to that... Um, rural uh, landed estate environment. Uh, when it comes to the factual point on residents, uh, I need to point this out. I mean, the main point that's been relied upon by Malone and Friend Mr. Day is set out in paragraph 29 of their skeleton argument. Uh, and the reference to an email from Mrs. Brake um, saying, well, he said it said that the cottage was not fit for habitation. In fact, what she says is far more nuanced than that. This is tab seven <coughs> of the supplementary bundle. Um, page 71, although it may in fact be tab 6, uh, page 66, for your lordship. Tab 6, 66. <coughs> and it's an email of the 9th of November 2018. So this is about the time that Mrs. Yeah. Mr. and Mrs. Brake last, last, for last long -term did. Occupation. Yeah, it says. First it says long term, yeah. and then it says at the moment, and then it says, and certainly not in winter, and then it refers to Mrs. Brake's particular health condition, hmm. and of course that doesn't apply to the other members of the Brake family. Yeah. And when, when we look at the next tab, which is the letter from Porter Dodson, on the second page of that, they refer they ask whether um, Axnola Events is prepared to carry out repairs. So in fact, it looks forward to, not in the sense of wanting it, but it, it, com it contemplates moving back into the cottage. And of course, the cases show that one can reside in somewhere that is not, that is not fit for habitation. One shudders to imagine what state the house of the um, gentleman who was uh, confined to a lunatic asylum for five years would have been like by the time he was released, but he still resided in this um, property. And of course, these letters need to be placed in context, because on the 8th of November, the day before this email, um, AEL uh, wrote to the Brakes saying, and this is quoted, quoted from the possession judgment, authorities bundle tab 36, 
page 71, paragraph 187. The AEL wrote to the Brakes and said this, you must vacate the house and move to your place of residence, the cottage, by close of business. The guy parties tell the Brakes that their place of residence is the cottage. So um, the judge doesn't refer to any of these letters in his judgment on the, um, on the residence issue and doesn't rely on them. Uh, it doesn't, certainly doesn't rely on these, the emails and the letter that my own friend draws the Lordship's attention to, no doubt because he didn't find it a very much assistance in, because of the terms that it's written in and because of the context that it's written in. Now, the fact that the judge found that they didn't like staying in the cottage and they only stayed in the cottage when they had to is, with respect, totally irrelevant. The case of the man who lives in the countryside at the weekends and <coughs> spends his weeks living in his London flat is in point. I dare say this um, commuter much prefers spending time at his, Lon at his countryside residence and, uh, and wouldn't be coming to London at all unless he had to for work. That's exactly the same position here. The brakes have to move into the cottage for work, in effect, in connection with the first the business and the duties under it. So those are those are those are the points I particularly wanted to make on, on residence. And it may be that um, my friend Mr. Coltuff will have one or two. Maybe he's shaking his head. Um, perhaps grateful that I've uh, dealt with that for him. Can we move back onto the first round of appeal now? Um, my own friend tries to distinguish the French and Barcham and Davis and Jackson cases on the basis that the trustee in bankruptcy um, is, is, well, I haven't, I'm not sure I've quite understood, understood it, but he says the trustee in bankruptcy, in this case Mr. Swift, was the successor in title to the partnership. In fact, he was a direct successor, successor in title to the liquidator of the partnership, who was also an office holder, and, and the liquidator was the successor in title to the partnership's beneficial interest. And moreover, Mr. Swift expressly contracted in his capacity as trustee in bankruptcy. So there is no distinction between that and the French and Barcham situation, where the trustee in bankruptcy was, Mr. French, was the successor entitled to the bankrupt, Mr. Barcham. The bankrupt had a right of occupation. The purpose of the trust set up by Mr. and Mrs. Barcham when they bought their house was for them to live in. That right of occupation doesn't carry forward to the trustee stepping into Mr. Barcham's shoes. That's a nonsense. The Act looks at the beneficiaries that you find from time to time during the lifetime of the Trust. And of course, the suitability point, or the purpose of the Trust, is just one of the limbs. The purpose of the Trust is one limb. The suitability of it for occupation is the other limb. Um, I appreciate that Mr. Justice Snowden commented on the particular situation before him where the spouse of the bankrupt was also occupying and said, well, it's unlikely to be suitable for an office holder to live there while the spouse of the, bank of the bankrupt is there. But um, in my submission, the point holds good where the, the office holder is the sole beneficiary. Um, and my Lord Lord Justice Lewis, and your Lordship's point about the, uh, Mr. Swift applying to court for his daughter to go into possession illustrates the point very nicely, if I may respectfully say so. So it's clearly a nonsense. And, and the fact that my learned friend had to agree with that suggestion shows that it's uh, um, that the submission is parting ways with reality. It was also commented that the Ingram case said nothing about rights of occupation under the 1996 Act, but of course not, because that related to a 1995 claim before the 1996 <coughs> Act came into force. And, and similarly, when my learned friend refers to the statement in the Law Commission's report about what a bare trust means, perhaps derived from Hodgson, Obviously, that, that's in the context of a report which recommends law reform, the result of which was the 1996 Act, which takes away, if, it, if there was that you know, uh, complete power in the, in the beneficiary to direct the trustees to exercise their administrative powers as, as the, the beneficiary wanted, it was taken away by the 1996 Act. What takes it away? Section 6 and, and, the, and the fact that it restates that the powers Right. of the trustee, of the absolute owner are vested in the trustee, even in the case of their trust. Um, but I don't accept that actually that statement in the Law, law Reform Commission's report is, is a true statement of the law prior to 1997. Ocean's Estate and Pinder, it's, 
about a dispossess disp it, it is about, and I think your lordship was correct to say this is the, the situation it hypothesizes, is about a dispossessing B when B is already in possession. Um, and, and so well, it could work the other way around as well. B dispossessed A and claimed to be entitled to do so through C. I say it's not about B taking possession from A when A is in possession with, with C's authority, because if it were, the whole Dutton argument would be a sterile one. That's um, B taking possession from A uh, with, with C's authority is the Dutton situation. And, and if that were the answer to it, then it would have occurred to someone before now. Uh, uh, C and Kung, the Hong Kong appeal, is um, an estoppel as between B and C. So the two contracting parties, it doesn't say anything about the relative rights of A and B. And um, the comment in Bannerman is a very um, rough and ready uh, category of, of situations in which uh, adverse possession by one person on behalf of another can apply. So paragraph 199 of the judge's judgment and the reliance on um, on that it is not orthodoxy. Otherwise, it would have been a complete answer. Let me just um, turn that up. Paragraph 199, page 103. Does it matter that it's not the beneficiary that dispossesses the trustee, but his or her licensee? I think not. If the licensor, i.e. the beneficiary, has a right to take possession but delegates the exercise of the right to the licensee, in my judgment, the licensee occupies the right of the licensor. Well, that's not orthodoxy at all in my submission, because if it were, that would be the answer to the Dutton point. As to the letter that my learned friend now relies on so strongly, the judge doesn't rely on it at all. He recites its existence, but he draws no conclusions from it. It's not raised in the respondent's response, in the respondent's notice. And it's notable how my learned friends are shifting their ground. The letter is not referred to once in the respondent's skeleton argument. Rather, they pin their case entirely on the license itself. In my submission, they're actually right to do so. My learned friend now says it forms an important part of their case, which they didn't trouble to mention previously. But, but actually, agency doesn't arise under the letter, because there's nothing in the letter over and above the license, for the reason that my lord or just as Arnold observed, they are seamless in the sense there is no difference between them. The one simply says, here's the other. So um, Cheddington does not occupy or take possession as an agent. A tenant is not an agent for the landlord, nor is a licensee under a tenancy-like license. A tenant takes possession in his own right. An agent takes possession in right of the principle. <coughs> Very briefly, my lord. Very early on in my learned friend's submissions, your lordship asked my learned friend if he accepted that he had to show that Swift, the trustee in bankruptcy, had a better common law right than break. And your lordship put it very carefully in those terms. Because your lordship appreciates that a right to possession arises at common law, a claim in trespass is a common law action, as is a claim in ejectment, a right to evict absent a court order is, in my submission, a common law right. In this two-party situation, where the beneficiary is not a party, both parties to the equity are not before the court. Equity doesn't get involved. Even if the parties to the trust were both before the court, there isn't a counterclaim. There isn't a trust action under Section 12 or 14 of Talata or otherwise. No one in this case, to use the learned judge's phrase, is crossing Westminster Hall to see the Lord Chancellor. And my learned friend's answer to your Lordship's question was yes, and his answer was right. He does have to show, therefore, that Swift had a better common law right, and moreover, that he has a, that he has to show that he has a better, Cheddington has a better common law right. And that's the thing that the respondent singularly fails to establish in any of the submissions that your Lordship has heard this afternoon. Unless there's anything I can help your Lordship with. And you say, therefore, presumably, that in deciding 
how to adjudicate matters between these parties now that the matter has come into the hands of the court the court should not maybe could not um, administer law and equity concurrently because no one has actually no one with the right to ask the court to um, administer equity is before the court and no one has made that request of that if if the trustee in bankruptcy potentially had joined decided to join in this action maybe this would be, all be different and the, and the arguments that would have been addressed to your lordship would be different but the trustee in bankruptcy very deliberately decided not to they were invited to and they said no yeah. Right. Could I just correct something my little friend said uh, about the letter? He said that it wasn't anywhere referred to in our policy. I'm afraid he's wrong about that. Could I just show you where it is? It's in the core bundle, tab 13, <coughs> page 169. I haven't got those Thanks. pages. Please uh, give me a paragraph so number. Uh, internal 10. Paragraph 32, right at the outset of our submissions on ground one. And it's set out in full. Paragraph, sorry. 32. Sorry. 32. On internal position. Yes, yes, I see. Yeah. Sorry, I do apologise. So it is wrong. referred to, although it's yeah. not. So, so right. it's recited, but where do you make it draw any conclusions from it? Uh, in 33. Had been so authorised. So you're, you're relying on both there, are you? A person who had been so authorised. Yes. yes. And also in 42. And also in paragraph 42. Yeah. And 43. Yes. So in the penultimate sentence of 42, because this is with 2.1, as well as the terms of the letter that accompany it. And in 43, the TIB, in the last sentence, the TIB license only accompany a letter with a clear instruction. Well, I offer my so little friends we, we clearly, unreserved apology. We clearly say, uh, as was the case, that we were authorised uh, by uh, the, 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 the Mr. Smith to do Right. That. I, miss, I, miss, I was misled by doing a word search on the on the supplementary bundle, and for some reason it didn't show up. So I apologise for that. Um, my position, finally, on, on the ground three, yes. is that it should be dealt with by way of consequentials in this court because it is a matter that's been raised by way of appeal, rather than remitted to the to the. Court and what is that? That would be quantum of damages and whether an order for possession should be granted. Just the just the whether an order for possession should be granted. Quantum of damages, I accept. Your Lordship doesn't want to trouble yourself with that. Right. Well, thank you very much. We've um, got through it in a longish day, or six hour estimate wasn't far off. Well, we're very grateful to you. Um, sitting late so um, we'll obviously take time to consider our decision. Um, at this stage in the term, I'm afraid you may have to wait a couple of months before you get anything, but you will in due course get a draft judgment. Uh, that will contain the new style embargo, which means what it says. Um, in the light of the draft, uh, you can correct any errors of English that we make, but not our reasoning. We would hope that you will be able to agree an order disposing the, of the appeal. If not, for instance, if you can't agree about possession or whatever else it is, um, well, you, my inclination is to do that on the papers, but it may be that we need, would need to... Con to um, convene another hearing. But let's see how we go. Um, I would rather deal with that on the papers if it's possible. Certainly. Thank you both very much. Thank you all very much.